My colleague Natalie, my comrade Natalie, is um, our chair, the chair of the Harley Society, and she's just going to tell you a little bit about the Harley Society. I'm the vice chair, not the chair, so like, the vice chair, so that's what's going on. Um, just quickly about the Harley Society, I don't know um, how, many, how many of you um, are familiar with us, but essentially we're a group of socialist lawyers. So um, while we're all socialists, we're not all necessarily lawyers, we have lots of students, Law students, paralegals, um, trade unionists, academics, anyone who really wants to get involved and see about the socialist um, side of law. So we put on different lectures like this one uh, with different groups. Uh, today we've also been assisted by uh, CAMPAC um, and Peace and Kurdistan as well. And um, we're still also vice president of Norway. That's true. And she also shares, uh, we share her expertise as well as one of the vice chairs. Um, if you wanted to get more involved uh, with Haldane, obviously speak to us about um, becoming a member. We put out a really great magazine called Socialist Lawyer at least three times a year with fantastic content. Um, we also legal observe, so if you're interested in, interested in learning about protest law um, and want to ensure that the right uh, to protest is being um, respected by the police, so we can you up and yeah, speak to either myself or Stephen in the back. Uh, also, we have a Haldane Feminist Lawyers Group, which does different book readings and lectures. And um, yeah, I will stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> and a fabulous um, um, meeting earlier this year, conference. Uh, oh yeah, and we had a, had a really good conference called Women Fighting Back, which I've also touched um, on. It was an issues. amazing conference. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just introduced our great speakers here. So first we'll hear from Rahila, who's in the middle. Rahila is uh, Rahila Gupta, and she's a freelance journalist, a writer, and an activist. Um, she's a long-standing member of South All Black Sisters, a domestic black violence organisation, and her articles have been published in The Guardian, The New Humanist, and uh, Open Democracy, and also this. She's also amazingly written a play and a film, <laughs> um, and she and B. Campbell are collaborating on a book called Why why doesn't the patriarchy die? Which will investigate how patriarchy fits with diverse political systems. It sounds really interesting. Um, after we're here, we'll hear from Joe, who's a writer, an activist, uh, an English teacher, and a former long term traveller. Um, she first met Kurdish people and began to uh, learn about their struggle whilst hitchhiking around Turkey um, several years ago. Since then, she visited Baku on several occasions and herself helped set up solidarity groups in the UK. Um, she recently visited Rojava with two friends as part of a women's delegation for International Women's Day, so she'll talk about her experiences there today. Um, and finally, we'll have um, a, a talk from Margaret Owen, who's an international human rights lawyer. Uh, she focuses on women's rights and has been on many missions to the Middle East region, um, observing and reporting on trials, monitoring elections, and taking human rights trainings. She's also twice visited North Syria. Um, and she's the founder and director of uh, Widows for Peace Through Democracy and a founder member of Gender Action on Peace and Security and also a patron of Peace and Kurdistan. So, first we're going to hear from Joe, so I'm okay. sure you'll join me. So, Rahila, I'm sure you want to begin welcoming Rahila. Do you want to stay seated? Or Is that all right? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Is that all right? I'll try and speak to you as I can. Okay, um, well, thank you, um, Halloween Society, for inviting us and for hearing the Peace of Kurdistan for organising this jointly with you. Um, I've also been to Rojava, which I kind of forgot to put in, in, in uh, but uh, just to say that I have seen the place for myself and feel really, really excited about uh, this, this amazing experiment that is going on in the place. And I'm um, so really happy to be here to be able to share it with you. Um, I've, I'm going to sort of speak in bullet points simply because I have quite a lot of things to cover and you know, perhaps we can come back in discussion to any of those points that you think we haven't been fully discussed. 
Um, so, I, so as Amy said, um, I went to Rojava because I'm researching uh, this book uh, that I'm writing, which is looking at patriarchy across the world and how it fits with um, dictatorships, theology, capitalist societies, uh, and democracies. And I felt, from what I've heard of Rojava, that there was no way to write a book about patriarchy without looking at patriarchy on its knees. I, I hope, I think, in Rojava. So, um, so it was a great experience from that point of view. But I've also written, um, I think, so far five uh, articles have been uh, published in Open Democracy on Rojava, and I'm going to write two more. Each time I think it's come to the end of the series as I haven't finished by writing it. So it's gone from three to six and now seven parts. So I suppose really the kind of overarching theme of, uh, of it would be it's raining within because uh, everywhere um, you go, um, the whole system is geared up to put in women in the driving seat. Um, so I just want to do a brief kind of description of the system and the theoretical underpinnings um, of, of it. Um, so you have um, basically uh, Ojiwan's basic principle is that no society can be truly free until its women are liberated. So that's kind of the story of it. He then goes on to develop what he calls his three uh, ruptures uh, theory. Um, of women's enslavement and then eventual liberation. So for him, the first rupture or the turning point, if you like, is the rise of patriarchy um, when the Neolithic okay. times ended and so-called statist civilization uh, began. The second sexual rupture was the intensification of patriarchy through religious ideology. And I think this is quite an important point because I feel particularly in the West, uh, the left has sort of ceded ground to religious fundamentalism. So we have a really strong critique of religion and the role that it plays in the West and is a really uh, significant part of Ujjwal's thinking. So he says, um, in the advent of religion, the treating women as inferior now became the sacred command of God. And the third rupture is yet to come. And this is the hopeful uh, rupture, which is the end of patriarchy. And again, in Ujjwal's words, um, it's killing the dominant men. Um, the other uh, interesting thing for me uh, in relation to Ujjwal's thinking is uh, the idea of intersectionality. Because I think, although in the West, feminists have understood the way in which race, class, and gender intersects, I don't think it has fully embraced. What, what Ojalan says is that without, uh, under capitalism, we cannot have uh, equality. And I think it's because we in the West also, uh, I think, I speak on that, I don't know if I speak on that, I mean, I but personally, there is a kind of defeatism around the fact that we can't actually end capitalism. So we try and do what we can in terms of I mean, in the end, our efforts become mainly focused and revolutionary. And I think so that, for me, was uh, an interesting part of Ujjalan's um, idea that feminism can never be totally and truly successful in the capitalist system. Um, and, you know, you, I mean, you find, for example, race equality, which again is amazing. Kur the Kurdish people in Rojava are the majority uh, population, and yet, in their parliament, they have uh, ceded that the power that comes from numbers by having a 10% quota for Kurdish people, 10% for Christians, 10% for Arabs. Um, and I think that that's quite an amazing uh, sign of racial inclusivity. <coughs> Similarly, around class, um, I wrote about this in my uh, Open Democracy piece. It was my first encounter when I got through the border. And uh, the guy who was um, doing my entry clearance papers, uh, who spoke a bit of English, uh, took me in to see his boss, um, um, Caravan, who then spent the next few hours talking world politics with me, um, which took me back to my university days without a care in the world. Um, and then the young man who was a 16-year-old man who was serving us tea, 
uh, I discovered that all three of them are the same salary. And to me, coming from the West, having seen kind of the defeat of the ideas of real equality, that's, that really was so inspiring. I can't tell you how inspiring that was. Um, and so I've been asked, um, what is the essential difference? So, so um, sorry, just to go back a bit. Um, the, the ideas that Ojulang has been promoting um, are bound up with um, a new, I suppose, a new branch of um, educational learning, which he, which he calls genealogy, which is Jin is the Kurmanji or Kurdish word for woman and or women, and then this is biology is about the science of women or looking at things from the perspective of women. And people have asked, you know, what is, what is the essential difference between feminism and genealogy? And I would say one is this idea, for me, at any rate, it's this idea of embracing, of understanding that under capitalism you cannot really um, uh, succeed as uh, in your feminist demands. Um, but from the point of view of genealogy, they say that uh, the, the reason, the difference between feminism and genealogy is that um, Western feminism demands equal participation in all walks of life, be it science, ethics, politics, education, or history. Whereas genealogy says that women must transform these areas of public life from a uh, feminist perspective before seeking to be part of it. So that is for them the essential difference between their way of looking at things. So um, just to go uh, into a brief description of uh, the system, uh, I don't know how much people know about it, but basically uh, there's a whole system of communes and councils which begins at the neighborhood level where you have uh, neighborhoods which can be as small as seven individuals because it's based in a village to 300 families because it's based in a town and each of these people um, have the right to vote for their representatives uh, who will look and, and then there are committees at each level so at the commune level at the neighborhood level there will be committees to deal with education and health and even practical things like for example somebody somebody gave me an example that sugar uh, was in great shortage uh, at one point, so people of the commune went to a meeting and said that we are desperately in need of sugar, and that demand was passed up the chain, and sugar was distributed free to the people in that um, commune. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so it, it has an intervention at every level. Conflict re resolution is a very central part of it, and domestic violence and other violence against women issues are dealt through dealt with through the conflict. Uh, resolution um, committee. So then, then each of those levels will uh, re uh, elect people to represent them at the next level. So from the commune you go to the city level and then finally to the mudges. It's quite a complicated system. I, I have to say I really struggled with trying to understand it. Partly because people give you different numbers of how many people are in the commune and how does it all work. So, and then, on, then kind of latched onto that, so you have men and women, oh yeah, that's what I forgot to mention is that at each level you have a, the, the co-presidentship principle, so man and woman share each of these uh, representative jobs. But on top of that, you have an entire structure, a similar structure, made up of just women, run by a women's organization called Congress Star. And they will run the women's co-ops, for example, as well. And the women's economic committee will be uh, located in, in Congress Star. Um, so you have basically uh, not just equality, because they're not just represented equally in the TEV DEM or the, the communes and councils that I was talking about, but they are also, but you also have a women-only autonomous structure dealing with all these issues from a women's perspective. So it's kind of tilted in favor of women in order to level the playing field, which is, I think, sometimes a concept hard to recognize in the West um, or to understand. So you have the same structure in, in the police force. So I'll say you will have male and female force, and then there's a women only force. The same thing in the army, the YPG. The YPG has women and men, and women commanding both men and women, and then you have the YPJ, which is only 
the, the women's uh, protection units. Um, and uh, what I have to say I was really impressed by was that, you know, they, 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 it's all very new, but, you know, it's, we're talking about 2011, the, the start of the so-called Arab Spring that all of this had started. And so um, uh, some of the ministries that have been set up of women, what they call the bodies, the women's bodies, they, they're also um, developing a whole new language, which I don't have any time to go into. But I'm calling it ministries for sure, but that's not their preferred uh, terminology. In you know a year or two, they have made the most amazing kind of advances. So just to give you a list of the changes that they have made uh, in terms of the patriarchal uh, laws that were in place before um, 2012. Um, they've, for example, they've banned uh, child marriage, they've banned forced marriage, downing polygamy have been outlawed. And then another really interesting thing, which I don't think we have in a country like India, which we could very well we could do with, which is any attempt to stop a woman marrying of her own free will will be prevented. So the opposite of forced marriage, which you know you cannot enter into a love marriage uh, if if your parents or your wider community are forcing uh, forcing you in that direction, that too is criminalized, which I think is an amazing. Um, Legislation. Honor killings, violence, and discrimination against women, those have been uh, criminalized. And then women, regardless of their marital status, have been given the right to custody of their children. Again, I think this is very advanced for, the, for, for, for that region and for you know. um, A woman's testimony is equal to that of a man's. A woman has a right to equal inheritance. Uh, and so on and so forth. Really impressive work when you consider that the women's ministry has only been set up in January 2014. Okay. Um, and also, I just want to reflect a little bit on the resonances that I felt um, uh, meeting Kurdish women uh, in Rojava as a black woman in Britain, because we are situated at that intersection. Uh, between race and gender, where uh, it's quite a difficult, you know, looking in two different directions, you know, carrying um, two different intersecting. So, for example, it's very, it's very difficult when you live in a racist society to raise the issue of domestic violence. But when we first raised the issue of domestic violence, we were afraid that people would uh, see within a racist context that black men or Asian men are more savage, are more barbaric. So we were very careful to make the links with domestic violence happens across all classes, all races, etc., etc. And I found um, what was interesting about Kurdish women. So for, uh, just to go back a little bit on that. So we are very sensitive to even talking about differential, uh, different kinds of violence in different communities because we're afraid that it might be picked up. Uh, as a, a slightly racist tool. Um, whereas I found it refreshingly and interestingly, Kurdish women were quite able to talk about the different issues that were facing Kurdish women, Christian women, Arab women, and felt quite uh, were able to talk openly about the fact that Arab women have faced the hardest times because, in terms of polygamy, in terms of the conservativeness of the um, uh, Arab uh, society, it, it, is, it is the worst uh, for them. And I, I was reflecting on that, and I found, why is it that they were able to say these things, and I was able to be able to say it about different communities in Britain, and I thought it really was because the racial inclusivity that you find in, uh, in Rojava means that people don't see it as a racial slight, they see it as a description of the reality on the ground as it is. So I thought that was um, really quite interesting. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about um, the, the sort of challenges uh, that this, um, uh, this region faces, both um, external and, uh, in, and internal challenges. So it's, it's really an embattled community. It really requires the support of the international community. I think there is a lot of confusion in the British left, about, uh, particularly those who are supporting the uh, Assad uh, opposition 
um, there is a certain degree of hostility to Rojava. They seem to think that the Kurds are uh, seeking autonomy and the breakup of uh, the Syrian state. The, the, the Kurdish uh, political movement has changed and developed, and the thinking has developed, and no longer are they demanding uh, a, a statehood. Uh, they're not demanding Kurdistan, but they're demanding uh, really is um, autonomous areas, self-determination, democracy, because they recognize that they're ethnically mixed and that, they, and that the idea of defining nationhood in terms of one ethnicity is not the way forward if you're looking for a truly democratic uh, society. So, um, so there are, there are you know, quite a lot, of misunderstanding, a lot of misunderstanding, which means that support is not given in the wholehearted fashion that we need to give it. That's, that I'm talking only in terms of the sort of you know people who are politically active. Of course, at an international level, there it is so um, complex and so difficult to disentangle. But you've got, uh, for example, because the Rojava forces are the most um, effective fighting force against ISIS, you have America giving it uh, air cover which then leads to further suspicion on part of the left because you're associating with an imperial power. As far as Rojava is concerned, they say we need to survive and we will take whoever's assistance, whoever gives us assistance, we are going to get that assistance. And they won't have, they won't have been able to have the successes without that uh, American air cover. On top of that, confusingly and complicatedly, Russia and America who are on opposing sides, Rojava brings them together particularly before, before uh, Russia withdrew from Syria, its forces, it was also providing air cover for some of the other um, battlefronts with ISIS. So there is that confusion. Turkey is an implacable, hostile enemy on its northern border because it's got its own Kurdish population to deal with them, which it's sort of brutally trying to quash. So you've got, but Turkey is also America's ally. So, so, so then you've got the KRG on the um, eastern border, and the KRG is the, is the Iraqi Kurdistan uh, side of it, and they should be, as Kurdish people who have fought for many years for a similar dream, they should be supporting the Rojava experiment, except that politically they are you know, conservative, the regime there is tribal in its outlook, and it needs Turkey because it's selling its oil to Turkey. So it's dancing to Turkey's tune and Turkey is saying shut the borders, suffocate Rojava. So these, so these are some of the um, external challenges. Um, and I just heard today, in fact, that after ages, the, the PYD, which is the dominant party in Rojava, is being uh, invited to the Geneva conference, uh, the, the next round of talks, which is amazing, because the last three rounds they've been excluded. Um, so that's, that's quite an important uh, positive development. Um, so the internal challenges really, um, you know, it's a war economy. I mean, it's doing all these amazing things while it's fighting ISIS on the one side. There's a shortage of medicines, shortage of food, the borders are closed, shortage of housing. There are refugees coming into Rojava from Raqqa, from Sinjar, um, you know, from all sorts of places. Uh, one figure that was given to me was 400,000 refugees. And you look at the way the debate is carried on in the West, you know, about like how many hundreds can be accepted by Britain. And you've got this tiny little sliver of land with very, very little, uh, few resources, um, trying to accommodate 400,000 refugees. At the same time, it's got emigration, it's got you know, a brain drain, and the professionals that are leaving. It's dealing with war debt because people are losing their lives. There's, you know, in most of the, almost all the families that I stayed with while I was in Rojava, somebody had lost a son or a daughter, a brother or an uncle or a sister. So it was, it's quite extensive, the losses that they have faced. Um, is that another minute or two? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, even in the short term I was there, there are different aspirations, you know, so although a lot of people are really enthusiastic about the experiment, you know, this is our revolution, we want to nurture it, we want to, 
We want to advance it so we are prepared to work for free and people are earning very, very low wages. They, they call it a symbolic wage. That's what, you know, it's, it's sort of a pittance, basically. And some people are not happy with that. They say, I can't, I can't make a link with this sort of money. So those sorts of aspirations are going to begin to create uh, fractures within that society at some point, you know. So that is, a, that is a worry at the moment because everybody is focused outwards. They're holding it together. Uh, and they're aware of it. People that I spoke who are, you know, at the parliamentary level and the ministries are aware that this is an issue. Then there is that, um, the ideological, um, sort of uh, conflict between the idea of Kurdistan as a nation state and the idea of self-governing uh, democratic, you know, because there's a little bit of a fuzziness around that, how will it, they want to expand this experiment across all of Syria, which would be amazing if that, if that was to happen. It would, it would be a completely different kind of country. But then you say, okay, so who will be at the center of it? You know, there's no answers. Will Assad be out? Will he be in, you know, if he's in, there's no way you're going to spread this um, experiment across the whole Syria. So those sorts of, there's a whole kind of fuzziness about the future. And all they're trying to do at this moment is win against, I think they will win against ISIS. I think ISIS will be defeated and they will be out of Syria. But that could also lead to the downfall of Rojava because they will lose their usefulness for America and America could quite easily dump on Rojava at the end of the day. So it's a very fragile, Experiment, but it is it gives us a lot of room for hope, and you know, for all of us who want a root map out of this squalid neoliberalism that we are finding ourselves in, we have lessons to learn. Thank you. Everywhere. And then um, 
you know, I'd read a little bit of his stuff before. I admired him already very much, but I was still a little bit unsure about that. So um, later when I started to read, especially this pamphlet and some of his other books, I think there's some over there on the table if people want to have a look at it. And I read about a lot of the, the ideas that he has that Rahila was talking about, and I kind of came to the conclusion that he is he's the leader of the PKK, he's considered the leader of the Kurdish people, and this is you know a great deal of power that he has, and he kind of handed it to women, to the women, and told them you need to go and set up your own structures, you need to be independent, you need to um, be completely apart from patriarchy and male-dominated society. And so with that in mind, and considering his long-term solitary imprisonment in Turkey, I've, I've really begun to understand um, the admiration and the love and the want to to have his image in prominent places. Okay, so Rahila talked a little bit about the YPJ. I think they're quite famous. Um, this is done on one of the marches. So one thing I also didn't know was that there were three different sort of armed structures in Rojava. I think you talked about two of them, right? You talked about the YPJ and the Asayish, who were like the police. These women at Asayish. Um, the whole of the, the Women's Day Parade was completely on, uh, guarded by women. There were only women guarding it. So there were the YPJ, the Asayish, and then um, this woman is with the HPJ, which is new in the region. It's essentially an armed civilian self-defense force that comes from the communes. So the idea is in each commune, they're organizing their own self-defense for their own commune, regardless of like, all the different ethnic groups, communities. And again, like all the other structures, they have a mixed male and female one, and then they have a women's one too. And this woman was wonderful. She, um, she did this, and then I said, oh, is it okay to take a picture? And she was like... <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh. So yeah, there's men and women of really all ages, with children, grandmothers, wearing traditional clothes or modern clothes in the HPJ. So it was very inspiring to see the real participation of the, all of the communities. <laughs> and there were really a lot of people uh, telling me, take pictures of my children. <laughs> Uh, here we have the men at the side of the demonstration. I particularly <laughs> like his facial expression. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I mostly spoke to women. There was one man um, in a, a very upper position in the HPJ that I had a really, really long conversation with that was really interesting and I learned a lot from that. But aside from that, I really only spoke to women. So when I saw these men like this, I did kind of wonder, you know, what do the men here, the more the men, like, think about what's happening? So that's a, certainly a question. This is the um, Free Women's Foundation new centre that they just opened the day before we arrived. Um, so they invited us on the, on the delegation, and they provided us with translators, they showed us around. And it was really very, very open. Like, we would say, we want to go and meet the Asayish, we want to go and meet the YPJ, we want to go and meet the PYD, and they just arranged it. You know, someone would get on the phone and they would arrange it like the next day. So I felt that it was really, very open for us to go anywhere. Well, not anywhere, but to meet whoever we wanted to. So the Women's Foundation are really busy, they have lots and lots of projects. I actually have some papers about some of their projects that I'll put on the table afterwards, um, just to look at, because I don't have very many. So one of the things they're doing is they're opening women's healthcare centres. The aim is to eventually have one in every neighbourhood in every city. It's for women and children's healthcare treatment, and they're also running education programmes to teach women about health, about their bodies, um, in general, women in the region have not really known very much about their bodies. There's a deep shame about bodies and things like that. So there's a big 
conscious awareness of that situation and a will to, to change it by educating women. So this is one of the healthcare centres um, in Sedekania. So it's really very basic, as you can see it's very small. Women come from really far away, they walk for hours from the villages to come here to be treated. Um, the women running the place, you can see there's like not a great deal of medication, it's very difficult to get medication in. And so this is the woman who's sort of like the most involved there, and one of the women that she's working with. So she's got some medical training and she's training up the other women who are working with her. And she's really, really very well known and respected in the region when we saw her Women's Day Parade, everybody was coming and, and saying hello to her. And she's doing really, really great work there. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of challenges about healthcare, particularly. Buttons stop working. This is a, a women's park that's been opened recently, also in Serekania. So it's not only for women, but it's been kind of dedicated for women. It's a place where women go with their children. But there's also some men walking around as well. It's not like an exclusive kind of park. And this is one of the um, pre preschools. So as well as women's healthcare centres, they're aiming the women's Foundation are aiming to open a preschool centre in every neighbourhood of every city too. We visited two of them. And one of the things that was quite interesting for me was, um, so Rahila talked a bit too about some of the criticisms and the sort of like misunderstandings and um, I can't remember how you explained it now. But um, from the left, but also from um, what I would call like, like revolutionary Arab movements. I'm reading a lot of like criticisms about Rojava where they're saying things like I've read that Arabic children aren't allowed into the schools, I've read that they're not teaching Arabic in schools anymore, I've read that Arab people aren't allowed in the armed forces and things like that. And so all of the time I was just asking questions about that and taking pictures of things that kind of show it's false. <laughs> it's just false. So I saw like Arabic being taught in the classes. I asked about the, the children's, you know, the demographics. There were Arab children in all of the classes. Um, this was the second school we went to. So yeah, they had like writing in Kurdish and Arabic and English and books in different languages. <coughs> okay, and then we met the YPJ. This was one of the most, well, no, I, there can't be a most inspiring moment for me because it was all very inspiring, but it was deeply humbling to meet these women who, and, and men too, who really are giving their lives, you know, on the front line and fighting with just an absolute solidarity and sisterhood. Like these women told us, um, we are one soul. They said, you know, and we could see that they, they really believe it and they really absolutely believe in what they're fighting for. So I took a picture with them, I'm actually. <laughs> this is um, to stop the car bombs. So we saw a lot of these kinds of constructions. This one was outside the YPJ. They've had a lot of issues with car bombs and it's kind of a constant threat. Also, when we were walking around, these kinds of things are also to stop the car bombs from coming in. And this was in the Christian neighbourhood of Sarekania, where actually there was a car bomb or a suicide bomb, I think one or two weeks after we left, and there were a lot of people injured and, and also some fatalities in that incident. So, it's really amazing um, to see the strength of this, of this movement and the strength, the, the extent of the changes and at the same time the gravity of the situation and this ever-present danger, it's just incredible to me. 
this one I took, this is just the main street in Sotokonia, just because I think that people often wonder about what general life is like. You know, we hear all these things about the war and you see images of the front line. But this is kind of, you know, a typical street life day. Okay, so this is the Molajan, which is the women's house. So this is essentially a house of justice where all these different um, legal issues that Rahila was talking about, like um, these new law changes where they illegalised or like outlawed different types of activity like sports marriages, domestic abuse, um, all these kinds of things. Women with these kinds of problems can come to this house and they solve the issue together. So they have a very restorative approach to justice, kind of almost a mediatory approach to justice, I would say, where they meet together with all of the people involved where possible in a conflict, be it two tribes or two families or two people or whatever, and they try to reach a solution together. So they don't have, um, our other speaker is going to talk more about the legal situation afterwards, so I won't say too much about it because I'm sure you've got longer than me. But this was also really inspiring for me as as somebody who I used to do um, community mediation, so I used to go like around neighbourhood disputes and, and do this kind of mediation. And to me, from what they were saying, it was kind of that on a greater kind of community level. And yeah, I'll let you talk more about that. <laughs> so these were the women that we interviewed in the Malajan. Very, very, this woman especially, very, very strong woman with really a lot of passion for what she's doing, what they're doing there together in the new system. These are the women in uh, genealogy, the women's science that Rahila was telling us about. So we spent, um, I think, half a day with these women, and there were some other women there too, having discussions and debates about uh, genealogy and feminism and also social movements in different countries. And I realised that a massive part of their revolution is to be very much aware of all of the other things that are happening in the world, all of the social movements, they're very aware of different kinds of feminism in different countries, they're very aware of historic revolutions and social movements, and they're critically analysing all of these processes to see what they can learn from them, to see what they can take and to see what isn't working. This was one of two refugee camps that we visited. So this particular camp is from, is that the end of my camp? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> this particular camp is for Yezidi people who survived the Sinjar massacre. So it was really very potent to go there and also to meet some of the women, especially these women who had survived that tragedy. Um, this woman spoke with just so much strength and passion, I can't possibly describe <laughs> that to you. Um, but she talked also about how so many of the survivors of this are actually even going back to Sinjar and they're founding women's, um, women's councils there and they're bringing this system to that area too, which is traditionally like a much more conservative tribal um, area. This was the second refugee camp which was predominantly or I think totally Arabic people um, who fled from ISIS. Um, they fled from Raqqa, Deraz or Mosul. And also in this camp they're trying to set up women's, um, women's councils, women's programs. They've got like a sewing um, workshop or courses there and like childcare, basically focusing on trying to get women out of their houses or their tents and kind of getting them together to begin the process of having, you know, women having community together for all of the reasons that Rahila also talked about um, when you talked about the, the analysis of how Arabic women have had a kind of harder time because of the more entrenched ideas around patriarchy in general. So the only NGO present 
in these camps is Hey Basul, um, which is part of the Kurdish Red Crescent. There were um, UNHCR tents around, but everyone was very keen on telling us the UNHCR aren't here, they just give us tents. Um, and the reason why they're not there is because they, because of the politics, basically. So it's considered to be part of Syria, they don't have Assad's permission, there isn't a Syrian flag, and so for that reason the UNHCR can't be there. Um, I've just spoken yesterday to two friends who are there now, who are medics, um, who are currently positioned with Havasor, and they said that Havasor is trying to get kind of international charity status or something as well, and so they're going through the same difficulties. Because in order to do that, you have to recognise that you're in Syria and you have to have the, um, the permission of the regime. So it's like another layer of difficulties for the healthcare system, basically, which is really vital. This was a shop inside the refugee camp. And this was the meeting space where they had the council meetings inside the refugee camp. Um, so this was the, the economic women's house. Um, so the women also have their own economic system. And this is the place where they predominantly deal with cooperatives. They help new cooperatives set up, especially in this one, because it's the women's one, women's cooperatives. We were fortunate enough to meet one, to go to one women's cooperative, which is just being set up now, which is this one. It's called Bistano Rojava, or um, Farmers of Rojava. This, is, this was uh, the front line not very long ago, so the signs of the war were really, really present. And it's being transformed into kind of a little paradise, really. <laughs> so it's going to be a greenhouse cooperative growing fruits and vegetables, um, cooperatively uh, women from 18 different communes growing food together. So they're building an on-site education facility to teach women how to how to do these things because this is traditionally a it's traditionally men's work and so women don't have the skills. But B, um, as you maybe know, the north of Syria was Syria's breadbasket, and so the Assad regime only allowed wheat to be grown in the region. So growing other things is also you know these skills have been lost quite a long time ago and they need to have these education programs. So they're growing all kinds of vegetables already, even though the cooperative hasn't fully set up yet. They're growing trees in a very, very treeless region. And this is the autumn woman who's planting these things and sowing the seeds for the cooperative to begin. She's from London, by the way. Is she? Yes. Yes. She's my favourite person <laughs> in the world. <laughs> this is one of the problems in Rotterdam. It's a very, very small problem, um, but it's been responsible for eating away at lots of the crops. So for this reason, they're using some insecticides in the region. But apart from that, they're not using uh, uh, chemicals at all, just trying to do it as chemical-free as possible. This is another problem, <laughs> especially this. So we are not sure how familiar you are with the layout of the region. I can maybe show a map at the end. But the main city in Rojava is Kamishli or Kamishli. And the regime, Assad's regime, currently has still half of it. So it's a very strange situation if you're crossing town, you go, you're suddenly in Syria proper and you go through Assad land and there's all, you know, regime soldiers everywhere and it's a little bit strange. And then suddenly you're in yellow flags and they're around space again. <laughs> this is another problem. Turkey. This is the border with Turkey. While we were in the region, Turkey was bombing over the border on several occasions and people were dying like who lived close to the border. So it's something that wasn't reported on at all. And actually on one occasion we were we were visiting some people and we got kind of stuck in Kanishli between a shootout with the regime on the one side and the bombing from Turkey on the other side. And you become quite aware of how much control Turkey is trying to exert in the region, even though it's a different country and everything. Um, especially when my friend went to take a picture from the top of a roof 
and as soon as she came down, her entire phone memory got deleted. It was really quite creepy. Deleted forever. Okay, so I'm going to the end now. This is another problem. So they have too much oil in the region. <laughs> they have a lot of oil and they have no way to refine it. So the oil is coming out of the ground and it's seeping into the fields and so they're burning it off. So there's really a lot of pollution as a result of that. You can see all of these, there's thousands of them and they're mostly stationary, they're not working. Um, but people still have time for that. <laughs> this was a celebration for the end of an um, academy course. So at the end of all the academy courses, they have these big celebrations with singing and dancing and talks and poetry and, and stuff. Okay, so I just wanted to talk at the end about um, a couple of projects. So some friends in Rojava have are starting a new project and they're fundraising for it. So the idea is to make the region completely self-sufficient by producing organic fertilizer from the waste of the region. They're trying to raise 180,000 euros and they've currently got almost 80,000 and they've got about 10 days left. So I would really encourage people to help fundraise for this really, really great project. Um, I'm going to put some links up at the end that you can copy so that you can have a look at their really good um, videos. And these are, yeah, a lot of the people are people that we met and I, I, they're very, very inspiring people. And some really good ideas. And um, this is a website of a project that I'm now co-coordinating, which is basically a project to um, research and distribute information about cooperatives and the cooperative movement in Rojava and also in Baku in the part of Kurdistan in Turkey. So I'm coordinating this with one other person. This is our website. We are scouring the internet in many different languages, translating everything we find into English, putting it here. And now we're about to start the second phase of the project, which is to go and inspire the UK cooperative movement to have an interest and to show solidarity with what's happening in the region. Um, so these are just the two websites I just told you that. Okay. Great, thank you. I can't bear to be, have to talk after these two amazing women. It's just been wonderful, both of you. Absolutely so rich, giving you the most incredible idea. So I'm probably going to be terribly boring. And uh, try not to talk too long, not to repeat too much. Um, anyway, as you can see, I'm very, very old, and I would love to spend the rest of my days in Rajava because I'm fascinated by it. It has huge problems, I know. They're enormous project problems, but this is quite extraordinary to me. It's in the midst of an absolutely terrible civil war and in a region which is the cradle of such um, patriarchy and where the status of women is so low that this incredible experiment and initiative has taken off in that context. It's terribly fragile. There have been periods in history when this has been tried before, I mean, to the Zapatista and after the Spanish Civil War. It never got any support and it failed. I beg all of you and talk to everybody you know don't let this extraordinary initiative fail because it is quite amazing. And also, to me, it's extraordinary. When you talk to all the women in Rajava, if you talk to the women in the YPJ and you ask them, where does this ideology come from? They do all say, it comes from Akko. It comes from Ochalan, who's in his 18th year of incarceration on the Isle of Imri and he should be released. And it's amazing to me that this 
comes from this man. It never came from Nelson Mandela. It never came from Gandhi. But this man has understood that you cannot have a fair and a democratic society unless you have women's equality, the empowerment of, wi of women. I don't want to repeat everything that's been said, but just to give you, because we, did, we didn't show a map in the end, but what's happened is that Kobani, there's three cantons, they've given it this, on the, it's on the northern Syria, its border on the east is the Kurdish regional government, the KRG, yeah. and then you've got that one, that Turkey, one. and it's three cantons going from east to west, it goes Kobani, Afrin, Afrin, Afrin and, Chis Chis yeah, yeah, and Chisira. And it, that's how you can see it. And I came in, and I think you two came in, on the Fish Harbour border from the KRG. The first time I went, I got into a funny little metal boat at sunset and went across the Tigris. And it was sunset, and there was an incredible black Juba Mountains against a red sunset. And out of the sort of shadows, a deep voice said, Oh, you Margaret! And I was welcomed in to, the, uh, to, to Rojava. And I'm afraid when I went last year, it was a very, very different story. And we had a terrible time at the border, a lot of problems. Uh, I won't go into it now, but actually, again, something you have to know, that the border now between the KRG, the Kurdish regional government, it's often closed. It's terribly difficult for people to go in, but you've all got to try and go there. And actually, it's stopping um, the delivery of desperately needed food and medicine into Rajava because of that border. Um, I think um, they declared, it was called um, Rajava, that's the Kurdish word for West, Western, but now because they've got more than two million IDPs, they're not unfortunately called refugees because if they were refugees they'd be registered under the UNHCR. They're internally displaced persons and no humanitarian aid is going in there. And they're almost half the population now, nearly half the population, are IDPs who come from all ethnicities and religions. So there are Arabs and they're Turkmen and they're Syrians, they're Copts and the, you know, Yazidis. And to reflect this extraordinary new Rojava, they declared themselves the Federation of Northern Syria in March this year, um, because now it is a poly-ethnic poly community and actually reflecting the fact that it is poly-ethnic, it actually, the three official languages are Kurdish, Assyrian and Arabic. And that is amazing because as you know, in all the four countries in which the Kurds had to live, since the end of the First World War, they were never allowed to use their own language. They weren't allowed to use Kurdish. Kurdish wasn't allowed in the schools. And that was a terrible thing for everybody, particularly for the women who could never access education. So this is amazing, not only is it Kurdish, but it's also all these other languages as well. Um, and I long to return there. And I've got an idea for all of you, because it's the new University of Mesopotamia. I think that's mainly in, in Kamishli. And they desperately need books, and they desperately need teachers. And I hope even in my very old age, maybe I can go that, back there and teach English, and maybe teach what we know about international mechanism for women's human rights in the University of, of Mesopotamia. I don't want to repeat everything that's really been said, but um, I think that it's Ochelan who, I mean, there's a, you can Google the charter, the first charter, which is in 2011, the charter, but now it's the actual constitution. And it's all written into that charter um, and in the, uh, of what the principles are. And what is really interesting to me, it's not a frill on the outside. Gender equality is central. It's right in the middle. It's absolutely central. And alongside with that, it's about pluralism. It's about freedom of belief. 
It's about communalism. A lot of people think that's communism. It is not communism. It is communalism. It's about people, people's participation, people's participation in decision-making from the very, very bottom up. And um, Rahila has also talked, talked, explained and described to you all these committees and things which happen even in the street, all the way up, who actually elect their representatives the next year and the next year up and the next year up. So you have this polyethnic, um, diverse um, religions, people represented, men and women, horizontally and vertically in, in the country. Um, I just want to say he wrote, I remember Ochoa, and I hope some of you do read his books. He's, he's inspired, of course, by somebody in my ignorance I never heard of till this summer, by the writings of the uh, political activist Murray Bookchin. Hands up, any of you who've heard of Murray Bookchin. Good, but his great partner and collaborator, Janet Beale, has written a book which is coming out with the Oxford University Press, I think later this year, and I can't wait to read it. So it's Murray Bookchin who actually also inspired Ochlan to actually think over the years how he developed about how we can have a really just, free and democratic society. And, um, so not on gender? Not no, not on gender. It's Ochoa who actually did this. He understood this absolutely because he spent all these years. He's written so many books, a bit like Gramsci, isn't he? Ochoa writing all these incredible books. I think some of them were written on toilet paper, and he didn't even wasn't even given paper and pencil. But he's written all these amazing books on his roadmap to to peace. And he said. Um, a revolution that fails to liberate women is not a real revolution, and the organisation that cannot organise women is not a real one. And he went on to say, the level of women's freedom and equality determines the freedom and equality of all sections of society. Um, I think I'm really supposed to talk to you about the legal frameworks. And... I and mean, it's extraordinary what they've done. They've really, because of course it's also anti-capitalist and it's anti-state and it's anti that whole way that in most countries, in all our countries, law is written in an extraordinary language that none of us understand and it's written there, up there by legislators who are, have never actually um, even consulted with the people about what they even want or what they want the law to do and the law should be there to protect citizens to give them their rights and to protect them and empower them and very often it's a the law is used um, in many countries um, just to actually uh, control and inhibit them but in here in Rojava the people also are part of that law process they are being consulted at every level so that when as Rahila and both of you spoke about it's quite extraordinary um, how they've actually, um, in, in the law, they've, uh, they've banned female genital mutilation, we didn't mention that, FGM, child marriage, forced marriage, polygamy, diary, honour killings, any acts of domestic violence and any attempt to stop an adult woman marrying of her own free will. And she talked about they might like, not have custody of their children. There can be no divorce by talent, where a man could just say, I divorced you, I divorced you, I divorced you. And it's terribly important that they've now got the right to inheritance with so many women who've lost their fathers and lost their husbands. They have the right to inheritance. Um, in, so also, I think it's really interesting that, that every single institution, organisation, association, whether it's a political party, whether it's the army, an educational board, a medical board, a school, a commercial undertaking, every institution association must have co-chairs, a man and a woman. But now, because of this also um, uh, ethnic mix, this polyethnic thing, they are also among the co-chairs, there must also be um, Proportionately, people who are Arab, people who come from the Yazidis, people who come from the Copts, the Christians, the Turkmen. So that is quite extraordinary. And then I think it's really interesting, in every village and town, there are these Malajina, the women's houses, 
um, where women can go. And I like, and you also spoke about it, they've got a real interest in not using the courts all the time to resolve issues which are so damaging, particularly in family matters, to have to go to court and have some sort of adversary procedure. They really try to do what we call ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, as you said, trying to bring the families together. Now, in the women's houses, the women can come with all the problems that they have, and if they might be family problems, or they might be um, between towns or villages, they try, their women lawyers who go there and talk to them and help them and um, see what they can do to settle things without ever having to go to court. And you talked, I'm only repeating, I'm not half as good as these two, um, but it's difficult coming after them. But when you talked about the women police, and then there's a particular section of the women police which is being developed particularly to deal with domestic violence. I was talking about this in Brussels at a UN meeting at the weekend and telling a, somebody from the American police that he should go to Rojava and learn what they were doing in Rojava. And I have to tell you this story because I think it's so interesting. And maybe I see everything with rose-tinted spectacles. Maybe it's not always like that, but this is so in what I'm told because I didn't see it. But there's also the right to intervene. That's interesting. So anybody in a street, in a village next door, they can intervene. That is to say they can say to the police, we suspect that something is going on in that house. It could be that a girl is going to be forcibly married to somebody, she's going to be sold to somebody, because that's happening. Girls are being sold over into Turkey. There's a whole trading thing about trying to um, sell down girls into marriages. Or it's about um, a man beating up his wife. It could be about all any of these things. And what happens on that suspicion Two women police officers go to the house with handcuffs and they handcuff the man and they take him away. That's incredibly humiliating for the man, just like it's incredibly humiliating for a member of Daesh to be shot dead by a YPJ sniper. My goodness, the YPJ women soldiers are brilliant, aren't they? Perhaps I heard they are so good. But the humiliation to the men about being arrested and taken away by the women police. And they go away and then they investigate it again. There is a real wish that they don't have to go to court, they don't want to have to punish somebody and put them in prison because that's another further damage on the family. So they re-educate him if he admits it. If he doesn't admit it at all, well, maybe he has to be charged and it has to be go through a court process. But all the effort is to avoid that and to try and sort it out and to re-educate him and take him back and let him go back into the home where they monitor it with the help of all the people who are the people on the ground, the people in the street, the people in the village. And I think, well, I've only got five minutes more. Um, so there are these incredible women's organisations and I have to say, yes, I'm ashamed and horrified by my own government and by the EU that it actually because of its great links with Turkey. It refuses, of course, it refuses to condemn Turkey for the terrible massacre that's going on gone in the southeast. But it's because of that that it will not recognize Rojava. And when, um, in my, with some of my other hats that I'm in meetings in the Foreign Office um, on preventing sexual violence in conflict or gender or on, on um, peace processes and women in the peace process, and I'm talking to the Syria guest and I mention Rojava, I tell you, the 17th century frames on the Foreign Office wall begin to tremble and shake because they're so embarrassed and nobody answers because that's what it's like at the moment. It's absolutely, you know, we won't recognise Rojava. It's not getting any humanitarian aid. It's become very complicated now because, of course, the United States are giving air cover to um, the YPG and the YPG People's Defence Units to fighting Daesh. But if that goes, it's all quite complicated. Um, what's going to happen in the future? But it's terrible that we don't, we aren't supporting Rojava with humanitarian aid. And it's also terrible when there's so much to learn from them, what they have done, and how you can actually change everybody's view. How do you actually change social norms? How do you change these traditions about women? 
they haven't done much about men. They have actually focused, the, the, the ideology focuses on the women, hoping that gradually it would change the men. And that would take much longer time because I quite it was fun. I was talking to about maybe 30 or 40 women in a room and they were all very, um, uh, you know, all participants. Whether they were illiterate or not, they were all part of what happened. They were part, partly, they were even jurors in the court cases, you know, they were there, they were in decision making. And then I said to them, and tell me, with all this new uh, empowerment and all these new initiatives you're taking, how many of you now have found that your husbands have changed and your husbands are helping with housework and looking after the children? I'm afraid only one arm went up. So that is more gradual. And it looks sort of, but all these things take time. And, and, um, but it is absolutely incredible, the achievements. And of course, they now have women judges as well. And they also have women judges who are appointed particularly to preside over courts which are dealing with things like domestic violence. What can I say? Try and go. Get that border opened. Um, and also, I think, thank you so much for talking about the cooperatives, because it's also very much about the ecology. And as you see, it was like just wheat, just wheat. And now that's what all they were growing. But now there's all this diversity that they have all these different that they, they've got to be self, they can just feed themselves, sustain themselves. So I think the cooperative is an absolutely, it's amazing, and I hope um, that we can all help you raise the money on, on that, because I think that's absolutely wonderful. And, and that's what I'm going to say. I haven't been very good coming after them, because he was so interesting, and I was probably just repeating a lot of things he said. Thank you. Simple one, I was wondering if you could on the map point out where Bourgeois is. I couldn't, I'm hunting for it, I couldn't see it. It's where it's saying. So, actually, there's my cousin, Bourgeois, who's going to be at totally different. So, you can see the green. Do you see Syria? Here it's called Syria. This part, I don't know, it's not. Syria. Yes, it's the other one is better than the other one. No, the previous one. Yeah. Well, maybe th this is like what's happening now, basically. <laughs> so the big black line is between Iraq, which is this part, and the yellow bit at the top here is um, Bashur, which is the Kurdish name for South. So that's North Iraq or South Kurdistan, and that has the, like, the autonomous government. And then the yellow bit next to it is Rojava at the moment. So the middle bump bit is the canton of Rojava, which is connected now to the canton of Jazeera, which is the biggest part. And then the canton of Afrin is the lonely yellow bit over in the other corner that's sliced off by the black bit, which is Daesh or ISIS. <coughs> and you can see the little red blob in the middle of the yellow bit. That's where the regime has half of the biggest city. The red bit is the regime of Syria. So above, above, so this, <laughs> this part is all the yellow bit, the pink bit, and the black bit, and this part is the right. Okay, you can use the mouse, mouse if you want. Yeah. You, you can use the mouse. mouse. Oh, yeah. This is Iraq. <laughs> the other this map. is Syria. And this yellow bit, and it's claimed like all of this part is Rojava. And then above this line is Turkey. There was another map that was a bit clearer. If you go, maybe go yeah, back. but they're, they're, it's not really clear because it doesn't was show. A, there was another one. That's the one before. Yeah, that one. But it doesn't really show, like, Afrin doesn't exist here. Okay. Um, here, the two cantons aren't joined up. Basically, every map you see is going to be different. Because the situation is changing quite fast, and more and more territory is being taken into Rojava, so the map keeps changing every month. Yeah, no, but something's going to move. It would be nice to see where Rojava is in, in relation to other places. It's, it, that, that map shows it, the first map yeah. that Joe showed. It's 
the border of the south of the border of Turkey. Yeah, I mean, you just hold it over to the other side of the border of Turkey. That's what it is, practically. That's where it is. This yellow bit and this yellow bit. And it's quite, it's almost about a quarter of it. See, the Gorgani is right on the border with Turkey. Excuse me? Your tea is filling up. Oh, it's Sorry, Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've got a lot of questions, but just a, a quick one first. Um, you call it an experiment. I'm, I'm kind of probably too much information or not enough information. I, I can't put in my head a timeline as to when the experiment started. So, relative to Ocheran being imprisoned, or the beginning of the Arab Spring, and then the war. I'm not really being able to picture how long this whole process has been going on. Well, I don't know if you want to answer, but like um, a lot of a lot of different women really told us the same thing, which is we've been in struggle for 40 years. Mm -hmm. This didn't just start with the revolution in Syria. Mm -hmm. All of the ideology and the systems have been being developed over the last 40 years. So it since the beginning of the, the revolution, which became the civil war and the breakdown of Syria in 2011, that they started to really put them into practice on a wider scale. But it's been happening for a, long, a longer time than that. So, sorry, but so the ideology of Ocalan to try and make it a, a women-led community, that's... I wouldn't say that's not that. Not that. The struggle for their own freedom, obviously. He has developed over the years since his imprisonment. Can I come in? Come in? Well, you have to actually look at the full history of the Kurds, and particularly though the development of the Kurdish movement since its formation, which goes back to 1970. In which period of history it actually emerged in Turkey, in a country which was so-called secular Kemalism, yes. where you had already a movement which felt was splitting from the main, you know, the sort of the socialist movement at a particular time already in the 60s. And in fact, I've been reading material of the students which included Ocala in the 60s, 70s, where they were discussing the problems of nationalist revolutions. So this is a very important historical point, because that discussion continued throughout the formation. Why was the PKK formed, is the first question in the first place. Why was there a necessity of a Kurdish freedom movement to be formed? You know, and of course, there are many reasons uh, that you can go back a hundred years to the colonialism and so on, that was great in sites we call the Western Internet, and so on. But the movement was at the same time aware that the Kurdish, that the Kurdish question, how did it fit into a new Middle East? It wasn't a question of just, you know, forming another state where the Kurds were living with Assyrians, Armenians, everywhere, and with other communities. And the Kurds were the first ones to be the target after the Armenians in, uh, in the beginning to be recruited into the Turkish state as, as some of the best. They went into the area, they cut people's uh, hair off, uh, particularly the women, and put them in Turkish schools. But, so that whole process was ongoing while they, they were trying to develop this kind of half-baked secularism in Turkey. So the Kurdish movement was always in this kind of period where they could sort of see the problems that they were facing with the state. And of course there were different periods where you look different at the state. You know, and they saw at some stage maybe the national liberation and forming the Kurdish state is the answer. But as I said, the discussions of how to do this and how to deal with the complex problems in the Kurdish region, where you had so many communities living, was already a question which Ocalan and uh, you know his comrades 
were uh, discussing, as I said, in the, in, the, in the start of the liberation movement in, the, in 1978, 1978, etc., etc. And it continued. And the women were actually in the forefront among the students. You had colleagues of Ottoman who were uh, who were then leaving comrades, like Sahine Sarkis, who was killed in Paris uh, with some other people, who were already part of that kind of ideas being developed. And then, of course, when they started the armed struggle, you know, the women were already there. I was there in 91 in the Baker Valley and I met the women there and they were discussing all these questions, you know. And this was in Syria, of course. And 80% of the people who were involved uh, in, the, in the armed struggle and were part of the PPK and were being trained were, were women. <laughs> so, and they had already their own discussions. And at the time, they were writing things down about women and were discussing this and were asking us, what's the women's movement like? And then they were looking, what did the women do in national liberation struggles elsewhere? So they were looking, of course, at South Africa, they were looking at, at uh, 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 Latin America, they were looking at Cuba, and everywhere they found a bit of a problem. Especially when they looked at Algeria, you know, where they had such a strong women's movement and after the revolution everything was gone. You know, so they were asking all these questions. So I'm sorry I'm taking a little bit of time, but I think all what I would advise is not to see this separate, to, to actually look at the history today and it's more important than ever because Turkey plays such a pivotal role in the whole question also in Syria, in the, in the whole Middle East, in Europe, you know, not to talk about the refugee question, you know, and we haven't even touched that, you know, and how the Kurds, what role the Kurds play in the whole discussion with Turkey and Europe and NATO, you know. So it's very important to put it in perspective and to see, you know, how A, the ideas evolved, and there are now more, more books written, not just by Ottoman, but also by other people. And uh, more studies done, of course, by the Kurdish uh, movement in all parts. And the discussion is continuing in the diaspora, uh, of course, as well. So, um, so I think this, that is why I would recommend, have a look. We put a lot of emphasis on bringing out the books now in English, and uh, there is an international initiative in Europe who are now translating about the fifth or sixth book. There will be Pluto Press bringing a volume out in uh, autumn about revolution in Rojava. And this will contain some of the material, also some uh, historically, not just theoretical analysis, but also historical articles and so on and so forth. So I apologize if I took a bit of time, but just for the context of the discussion, this is absolutely vitally important. And uh, I can say that we have uh, an attempt just on the women issue. We are trying very hard to push the women issue in Europe and also here. And uh, unfortunately, one of the women from Congress Star who promised to come today, she sends her apologies because I was going to ask her to make a contribution. But uh, uh, I think uh, we want to build the women alliance, not just for the Kurdish women, but for women in Syria, Iraq, and the Middle East. So, uh, and I would encourage any woman who is here to uh, get in touch and to discuss with us. So this is why we say Peace in Kurdistan Women Alliance. And this is, of course, together with the Kurdish women in Europe and with the networks they have and they are trying to push in the work. So we want to have this discussion in Europe as a central discussion to how do we, how do we get, uh, you know, uh, what Radila is talking about, how do we, do we finally get rid of the patriarchy? How do we change society? How, how do we change the system? And it's extraordinary because tomorrow I've got another meeting in the Syrian group 
Gender Action and Peace and Security with the MOD, the Foreign Office, and they are still in it. I mean, I keep thinking, really, finally, a real problem. But I go on, and I think we all of us have to go on about this um, because it's just so important. And we didn't talk about the refugee issue, and we can't, we can't I mean, talk about what on earth is Uncle Merkel doing, running down to Turkey and saying, we'll hurry you up to get into the EU as long as you keep all the refugees in Turkey. Because of course Turkey, I don't think Turkey even cares about getting, because it can't get into the EU, you all know why. Because it's never complied with the Copenhagen criteria, absolutely not. And I'm astonished that Turkey, but they'll never get rid of it. We should have closed down NATO in 1989, but I mean, uh, Turkey to be a member of NATO and getting NATO to support the way that Turkey has done more sorties against the Kurds than it ever did against the Daesh. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's absolutely horrendous that we should be so silent about what Turkey is doing. And now they've taken the immunity away from the pro Kurd, from all the MPs, and I'm quite worried that all these wonderful people led by, you know, some Latin directors are going to end up in prison. I mean, you know, and, and why, and we are silent. And so I beg all of you, through your MPs in every way you can, to, you know, to ask the questions that have to be asked. Um, I've said it. Stephen, and then this one over here. Um, thank you, first of all, to all the speakers. I've been coming to Haldane events for six years now, and that was the most moving one that I've ever encountered. Um, I've got two practical questions for you. Uh, firstly, what's the most effective way that we can show practical support to um, the revolution itself? And secondly, how can we actually get there physically? Why now you can't get the actually like the border is shut, shut, shut. Sorry, Brian Ed. Brian Ed isn't taking it. It's been really difficult to get in and out right now. I really saw it. Actually, I think yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are ways you can. Look, one of the things I was going to ask, in fact, I might know the answer to this. It sort of made me wonder whether you could get a visa, to Syrian visa. Go, go into Damascus because there are flights from Kamishno to Damascus. And it made me, because we, I didn't even consider that route I crossed at the Peshawar um, crossing from um, KRG. And you should tell your story about how you crossed because I don't. <laughs> you swam across. It's an amazing story. Um, um, I, yeah, <laughs> no, because, because it just shows that actually if you if you're persistent enough the borders can be porous. But at that time the border was, was open but, but since yeah. the day after we left it shut, shut, shut sixteen. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it, it yeah. probably yeah. will yeah. open again yeah. something's gonna change, yeah. sure. Yeah. And you should you know, yeah. keep your eye on that because there will be for sure at some point <coughs> if, if you get the I can I just I'll say we are actually in touch with all the people who can help for people to get across. Okay? So we are in touch with the movement, with the people on the ground. We are in touch with the foundation of Frojava, with Yekita Star, and so on and so forth. So there are representatives here, and there are representatives in Europe and in other places who will let us know at the moment, the main thing is to campaign, to expose that we can't get in. Yeah. And the, uh, what we have been trying to do, because another incident happened where the Kurdish Women's Office of Rebak in Iraqi Kurdistan was raided by the police, by the Balzani, by the Kurdish, unfortunately, Kurdish government, Assyria forces, and were basically deposits from the area. And now they have no offices there. Now this is an outrage because this woman organization, Repac, was trying to create links and fighting struggles across the region with other women, including Rojava. So they were a networking organization who spoke also on international platforms. So the question is, this is one step too far. So we are trying to start a campaign 
you know, to challenge the KRG here and over there. And we have to do this now because, of course, it's a bit of politically sensitive to create too many divisions among, you know, I mean, it's not an easy issue for the Kurds. But I think we as non-Kurds have to do this. We have to raise it with the government here. We have to actually write letters to the president, to Barzani, and to others. So Rahida has already, for example, done personal letter. So personal letters and even letters to the government to say what is going on here. Yeah? So that's one thing. But the other thing is to open the borders. This has to be a campaign on a wider issue. And we have some material which you could send around and you can sign and you can help us raise with this government. Because the government could help us do that. You know, because they have relations with the Bazani regime. So why not ask them to put pressure, you know, this government, on Bazani? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mohammed and uh, I'm also from Iran and uh, Middle East. I don't know whether to say fortunately or, or unfortunately. And uh, we have a similar problem, you know, as the Kurdish people have, I think, before they were just had a problem in Turkey, but now ISIS is there, so they have another problem on top, which causes very uh, hard for them and uh, challenges. We also believe that Iran is, in the region, is the main, uh, we call it godfather of ISIS. We believe that Iranian government, because here, uh, my fiance is here as well, now uh, we finished, um, her aunt has been executed by the Iranian government. Uh, so we have lots of problems, but luckily we have the organization um, which is led by a permanent role as like uh, you know, in Kurdistan. And I think we should be united if we really want to tackle this problem. All of us, you know, we should be just in one side and against the bad guys, you know, in, in a way. And uh, so I would like to invite you all, if you are interested, the event uh, is on 9th of July, and usually there is more than 100,000 people. There's going to be MPs from all over the world, and so we're just fighting, or in a way struggling, you know, and trying to bring the peace back for um, Middle East. Because it's, uh, I don't know if you guys see the news every day. You know, it's on my Instagram or my Facebook that these kids, you know, children and Syrian kids, are, you know, um, every day the explosion. And it's right now we're sitting here, we're talking here freely. They are suffering, and there's a problem. So uh, I'm sure if you guys even uh, international uh, um, political students or uh, um, from law society, if you guys have studied law, I think it would be very interesting and very uh, good experience to come with us. I will leave the flyers there. And thank you. <coughs> asking this question and there was a great deal of fuzziness and vagueness and I have to say this this really did play a lot of my inquiries about a number of things um, and then people would give you different figures and you know so you think well what's what's the correct figure partly it's to do with the fact that they're just all you know basically um, in a war situation you don't have time to record you know statistics surveys etc and all of that one of the figures that I have received um, from, uh, from a PYD representative in London is that 80% uh, of their income comes from the cooperative sector and 20% from the private sector. Um, they're not selling oil. Again, there's contradictions around this because it's very oil rich, as we've heard, which actually enhances its fragility a slice of reaction. Uh, but, but admirably, I'm told, 
that they are they are not exporting or selling the oil outside, which would have a good sense, good uh, uh, source of income, because they want to keep it as a national resource for the Syrian people for the post-war situation, because 80 percent of Syrian oil and gas is in the Rojava region. So if, if that is true, I think that's a really admirable um, uh, goal. Um, so so and a lot of people are working for no money. The other interesting thing is that uh, in saying Sizira Canton, about 60% of the government uh, employees are still being paid by Assam. Oh, the teachers. The teachers and others you know, in the government, in the municipality, they're being paid by Assam. And for the, the teachers, the interesting thing is the schools are shut down and the teachers are now using the same buildings to teach Kurdish language, which was supposed to be banned under Assam. So that in itself is quite a revolutionary act. But it also keeps the economy going because money is coming in to people from Assam. And I think his main uh, reason for doing that is to maintain a sense of control so that he can say, well, this is still, I'm still in charge in this part of Syria. And if in any post war situation, if once ISIS is vanquished, he might use all of these footholds you know, to um, get rid of the Rojava administration. I mean, he also, I don't want to sound totally negative, but you know, that's a possibility. So there is a huge deal of fuzziness, and there's austerity, i.e., everybody is equally poor. Everywhere I went, for example, we, te we tended to eat mostly, if, in terms of protein, it was mostly eggs, scrambled eggs. You know, and it was very, it was a very basic diet. And so there is poverty. And even when I went to meet the the woman who is now the co-president of Rojava, that's what she offered. That's what she ate. You know, it was, it was amazingly equal, but it was equally austere. I um, wondered about. The court system, is that Assad's court system? Is, are, are there prisons? Are there not prisons? Yes, I mean, there are there are prisons. And again, there's a, that's all a very, very fuzzy area, because I also had some funny talks in the last days, people try and come to, because, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you, I speak about Rojava in all these sort of glowing terms, but there are huge areas of blurred, understanding about what's going on and how and the distance between what the intention is and what's actually going on on the ground about who is in prison and what is happening because they've even said that when they've captured and they they've got rid of the death penalty that's another thing by the way they've also got rid of Sh Sharia, Sharia court yeah I've got to say that they've got rid of Sharia court which is amazing they've also got rid of the death penalty but they also say that they've captured um, uh, uh, some some of the the Daesh fighters and so where are they and what 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 what, what are their conditions in prisons i really i really don't know and because i've been focusing very much in the context of uh, women's issues and gender conduct i've been looking very much about you know these things like domestic violence rather than about how they're actually dealing with no, it's crime but actually how they're actually dealing with people that they've taken prisoner i don't know I don't know, maybe you know. Um, I but I know, I just have to say that also I have to say on every side there is massive misinformation on both sides all the time, even about the PYD. Or, there, I think there are 22 political parties and um, they're under the Ted Dem, which is the umbrella for them all. And as far as I know, because my sources come from the PYD, the PYD is working with all the other parties, but there's a lot of other information which is always trying to condemn the PYD in all sorts of ways, even to accuse them of being in league with the Assad regime, that they're using child soldiers, you know, all that sort of stuff. So there is a lot of difficulties, and I think it's a very good question, and I can't answer it. Um, there are still prisons. Rather than saying there are prisons, or say there are still prisons, like they haven't abolished prisons yet, no. they would like to abolish prisons, is what I've been told by people very much involved in the movement. At the moment, it's like a last resort and it's a, a short term situation. 
with the prisoners, yeah, I guess that's going to be a different thing. But in terms of the system itself, um, so when, when people go to these, like the Malajin, for example, the women's house, which is the justice house that I talked about, and the, the general, like not just for women, justice system, um, they decide together on the system of punishment, and they can choose to send it to the court system, which is from the Assad system. Also, interestingly, um, just a few weeks ago, the YPG or the SDF, like Syrian Democratic Forces, which includes the YPG, um, liberated a prison that was Assad's. Um, so that was something quite interesting. I heard that they liberated the prison, as in, like, released the people in there, but I'm not sure exactly how that worked. That would be interesting to find out. Well, I think they liberated those prisoners, and if they are, they are because of political prisons, they are released, but if they are but they are they are released, but they are they are they are they so what do you expect us to do? Yes, yes. You have Guantanamo in America, so... Yes. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, I only want to say some fine. very important thing, <coughs> because we are here with Haldon Society Socialist Lawyers linked. There is, there was discussion for the past three, four years, okay, that we have investigative, we have lawyers invited. One of the issues that was raised right from the start are uh, the help from the international community to work with people who are lawyers on the ground and to actually work with them for three, four months and to do an assessment about the situation in addition <coughs> to what the different committees are doing in Ottawa and to actually, you know, encourage not just, uh, you know, for a little while somebody visiting and giving some report, but actually working on the ground on legal issues. So I want to just mention that because that's still on the agenda and that this is something which could be planned because there, you know, whatever small kind of commentaries we get from uh, brief visits, you know, we need to actually you know, have some further associations, the people who are working on that from the Kurdish side, you know, and from the committees. And there is not enough. So, but the invitation is open for delegations. If we can get in. Well, at the moment we cannot do it. That's my point. But what I'm saying is, this is not just for a delegation, but this is for work sure. on the ground, on these very issues you have been discussing. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll probably finish up in a, a minute if, unless anybody's got any more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering exactly what the relationship is then between the communal structure and political parties, because I can't quite work it out. Like, uh, okay, the PYD is protecting the area and you have the communal structure, but then do parties actually exist? Are there parties there? Because obviously, I've read, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff on the internet and it tends to be, as you say, either what reads as extremely rose-tinted views of everything that's happening or everything that's happening in Rojava as a result of PYD dictatorship. There's no other parties allowed, blah, blah, blah. And it's very difficult to kind of understand A, where parties stand in, in, in this situation and B, it is quite hard getting a an exact glimpse of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, any no revolution is perfect, and, you know, to expect everything to be happening perfectly at once is just ridiculous, and nobody can expect that. But on the other hand, you know, it'd be interesting, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, so we, we were quite confused about that as well, so we went to interview the PYD about it, because we wanted to find out, like, how they fit it into the whole structure. So, um, it's, one thing I noticed is it's, everything's quite fuzzy, but part of that is because, for them, it's just really clear. 
and they don't really understand what we're not understanding. So I had to like quite often ask the same thing in lots of different ways, and then I would eventually find a way to get a good answer about a lot of stuff. So I think like part of the fuzziness is not just that people are just like clueless about it, although sometimes, yeah, but also that like people don't really understand like what the gulf in different understandings is in order to so basically, like as I understand it, the PYD is the face of the movement that goes to international meetings like Geneva. So it's there for that purpose. It's actually not like dictating what happens in the in the region. The decisions are being made at the communal level and they're going up like that. And the TEV then represents the representatives of all the different um, structures and committees and communities, <coughs> which all rotate really regularly and they'll have that's the council of ministers, isn't it? Which actually, yeah, so that's the TED and that's where like the decision making structure for the society there comes from that. It's not coming from the PYD, the members of the PYD are also part of those structures in their own communities and stuff. But there haven't been any elections yet for what I would call the legislative council or the equivalent of uh, what. Our parliament. So that's because they don't have that system. They no, but they're saying that they're, t- they're intending to have elections. That's what they said. But because so of the whole situation, they haven't got it. So those are nominations. So, every, so for example, the women's ministry, the economic ministry, or whatever, yeah. they are nominated by the highest. This is my understanding. They are they are nominated either by political parties. So they have some sort of consensus arrangement that so many people from this political party will be in this particular ministry but, and by ethnicity, by gender, all of these things are taken into account. But at the moment, um, at the very highest level, it's nominations um, and they, it's kind of consensus. It's not elections right yet. Okay, so most of it is we were from here than by election. Yeah, up to that, up to the um, city council level. It's election up from it's it. also uh, based from this bottom up, yeah. but as it comes up from there, up and up. So I think a lot of it is that people just don't understand what the system is and they go, well, there's only one party then up in the elections, but it's like it's not a, it's not the quite same system at all. It's a totally different world frame, you know. It is sort of indirect elections. The local community council. Nominate someone to go higher up. They nominate that group up. Nominate someone. I would call it direct. I would call it direct. But they're not mass elections. Yeah, it is. The learned peers chosen by the local people. Yeah. Yeah. Then those communities, those communities. Yeah. 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 Ye
to, to see people like yourselves, to, to visit the region. I haven't been able to go to Rojava myself, but I am reading about the democratic conference system and, and Rojava and the women's movement. But it's great to see your um, experiences. And thank you for sharing them with us. I'd love to just add one sentence to what you just said. I'm really glad that you said about the I really think that's important. And also, I was really um, inspired by the fact that it's a really self critical movement as well. Like, at every level, they're self criticizing too. Even on the individual level, like, there's a massive emphasis on transformation, self transformation. Um, building up what they call like a militant personality, like, you know, being very dedicated and very conscious of what, what we're doing, how we're taking in the system. And at all the different bodies we met, they all asked us, um, do you have any criticism for us? Is there anything you think that we can change? And so that's another reason why it's changing so quickly. They find a problem and they, they try and work it out. More than about the email. But I, just one more thing, I, I think you guys have um, put your emails and your details on the piece of paper that's been going around. So I think the Howden Society and the Peace in Kurdistan campaign would send you more information about everything that's been discussed tonight, especially about Rojava and democratic comparison. Yeah, we, we so all well, there's white pamphlets here. Go into open democracy because you've written all these articles on open democracy. I think I've only written one, uh, but you've written about six already. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.